Yeah, thanks for the invitation to talk today. So I represent our group, um, that's a NIAC phase two group. Uh, thanks, Jay, very much for that. Uh, it includes the University of Arizona, Southwest Research, Research Institute, the Applied Physics Labs, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, ASU, and Cornell. Just like any uh, new big project, it takes a whole village to, to make it happen. And again, I'm Chris Walker. I'm at the University of Arizona. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so why are we all here and why do we all care? Uh, we live in a galaxy comprised of stars, planets, and people. We want to know where does it all come from? That's the big deal. When we wake up in the morning, we want to understand where we are, what we're doing, and where we're going. So we work on the how did we got here part. Uh, next slide. And we do have an idea. Where we come from is the interstellar medium, the ISM. That's the gas and dust in between the stars. This picture was taken from Mount Graham, Arizona on a perfectly clear night. So everything you see up there is real that's hanging in the heavens. And if you lived 100 years ago, you would get used to seeing that picture. You know, the first time I ever saw that was I was like 25 already before I got to a clear sky. Um, this is where we come from. Every atom and molecule within our bodies comes from this interstellar medium. So we have a, 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 a strong primeval connection to it and trying to understand it. Uh, next slide. And it turns out that many of these atoms and molecules in the ISM from which we all came about five billion years ago have important transitions, atomic and molecular transition at far infrared wavelengths or terahertz frequencies. The terahertz frequencies are frequencies about 100 or 1,000 times higher than the typical uh, cell phone uh, frequency. And one of those lines, emission lines, is water, atomic water, 557 gigahertz, sorry, molecular water line, 557 gigahertz, has a ground state transition. And this, of course, is very important for understanding the origin of, of life. Um, and water was, has been detected in space, uh, most recently by the Herschel Space Observatory, which is a joint mission between NASA and ESA, European Space Agency. And here's some example of what these water lines look like. This is from an evolved star, but they also have been seen toward a uh, protoplanetary system, perhaps tracing uh, primordial Kuiper belt objects or, or, or Oort clouds, um, as is shown in this picture here. And so the, the trouble with terahertz frequencies, where all these nice lines, uh, emission, absorption lines lie, is that it's at terahertz frequencies. And the trouble is that the Earth's atmosphere, the water vapor in particular, absorbs almost every photon of terahertz radiation before it hits the ground. So we have to get up high to get away from the atmosphere. Uh, next slide. Um, here's a, 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 a NASA-provided slide from a, from a program manager a few years ago, which shows the NASA a portfolio, portfolio of flights as a function of, of, of frequency. Uh, here's a wavelength. Here's radio, microwave, infrared. On up we go into the X-rays and gamma rays. And the terahertz regime, the one I'm talking about, that really traces the ISM really well, the interstellar medium, is right here. And the only things we got going, we have SOFIA, uh, which is a two and a half meter aperture telescope limited in size by the fuselage diameter of a 747. Um, and then we have a JWST, which will fly later on. And as someone mentioned earlier, uh, JWST is great, but it has a dedicated suite of instruments, none of which are suited for probing uh, these uh, terahertz emission lines in high spectral and spatial resolution. And there's SOFIA, and we're limited to two and a half meters with SOFIA. And also SOFIA can only fly so many flights here, and there's only so many hours available. And it's very highly competitive. Uh, next slide. So what are we going to do? What's next? Because there's not going to be any more big space missions uh, in the next decade or so, other than the ones you see here. So what can, we can do next is we can use ballooning. Ballooning is a great way of probing uh, the terahertz regime uh, at a relatively low cost. And Seth and Ben showed a nice slide of a balloon gondola uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, next slide. So the concept we have is this thing called a large balloon reflector. And normally, like in the... Uh, and the, for the gondola that uh, Seth and Ben showed, this is, the gondola lives down here. This is what a, a typical uh, long duration balloon flight, flight train looks like. You have this, what we call the carrier balloon up here. It can be 100 meters in diameter. You have a parachute uh, with explosive bolts, or there may be thermal, I don't know. Uh, uh, Vernon would know, he's in the audience. And so uh, basically once you go around and you're done, you can uh, release the parachute and this thing opens up 
and it floats back down like an old Mercury or Gemini uh, capsule, and you can pick it back up again. Um, so uh, we actually have a, a, an ongoing program called the Stratospheric Terrorist Observatory, and we have a one-meter telescope that's down here uh, making observations of terahertz frequencies. But uh, the, the size of the, uh, of the mirror is limited not so much by weight, but by the ability to point. Um, so we, what we'd really like to have is a 10-meter telescope, something that can collect a lot of those precious photons from space and provide sensitivity and also angular resolution, which scales with the diameter of the telescope. So the idea we had, which we put forth to NIAC, and luckily they thought it was okay, was why not put a balloon, uh, not a balloon within a balloon up here and make a 10-meter reflector? As we heard in Kimberly uh, Smith's talk earlier today, a natural shape for a big mirror is a sphere, and it's like that one of the oldest mirrors people have used is a spherical mirror. So I said, hey, a natural shape for a balloon is a sphere, so why don't we blow a spherical balloon up inside this large balloon, which kind of you think of acts like a radome, and then metalize one part of that balloon and then use it as a spherical reflector or a spherical mirror. Uh, next slide. So here's a kind of schematic of what it looks like. Uh, the terahertz light comes in and it passes through the outer skin of this carrier balloon, which is basically kind of like uh, the plastic from dry cleaning. It's really uh, pretty transparent. In fact, we, I'm not sure in this presentation I have it, but we have an FTS spectrum of, uh, of the, this balloon material, and it's 95, more than 95 percent trans, transmission at terahertz frequencies. It's basically just not there. Um, in fact, the same kind of balloon material you could use as a beam splitter, uh, and like a lot of terahertz guys like me use beam splitters in their instruments. Um, so anyway, it's 95 percent or better transmissive, so the light comes through here. We'll just move over here to this uh, inset here. Comes through the, the outer balloon, the near side of this, this inner balloon, which it forms this tw it's 20 meters in diameter, bounces uh, off of a metallized surface in the back and comes to a focal line. That's the issue with spherical mirrors. They don't have nice focal points, they have focal lines that you have to correct for, like Kimberly was describing earlier uh, today. Uh, next slide. And so if you go inside this balloon, you can see uh, one way we help maintain the shape is there's actually what uh, dielectric curtains are called, which are strung across it that are orthogonal to the incoming wave front. So you blow up the balloon inside and it pushes out against these, uh, like this skeleton of, uh, of dielectric inside uh, that helps maintain a spherical shape. Um, and also the, these dielectric curtains are orthogonal to the incoming wave front, so they provide minimum, uh, essentially zero absorption or diffraction effects. Uh, next slide. Now, this is, is this totally crazy? Well, no, I don't think it's totally crazy. It's crazy enough for an IAC, thank goodness, but it's not totally crazy. And that this has been around for a long time, this basic idea. Here is Echo 1 satellite, 30.5 uh, meter diameter sphere, cover, uh, luminized mylar, circa 1960. And uh, I actually am old enough to remember this. My dad pointed it out to me. Uh, one night after a PTA meeting when I was a little kid saying there's echo up in the at sunset. And this was a, this is actually wasn't a stratospheric uh, reflector, it actually was inflated in orbit. So everything I'm saying about this in a balloon for stratospheric work, you could also do it in orbit because it's been done before. This actually was done first in orbit. This was a passive reflector, the whole thing was luminized. So you'd bounce a strong signal from the ground off of it and back again. I think Eisenhower had the first uh, a communication through a satellite like this. Uh, next slide. Okay, now the idea of using inflatable telescopes is, is not new. It's been tried and it works uh, to some extent. This is a picture of a parabolic inflatable uh, reflector uh, from an earlier STS-77 mission at a 14 meter parabola. Parabolas are, parabolas are great. This is what you want because the parabola has a single focal point, which is what you want to put your nice MKID detectors or transition edge detectors at. But the trouble is it's difficult to maintain the, the, the surface figure of a parabola to high accuracy. So if you go beyond 10 gigahertz X-band, maybe you want to go 557 gigahertz with its water lines at, or maybe 2 terahertz. Uh, you can't hold the par parabolic shape very easily. A sphere is a more natural thing to use. Uh, next slide. Okay, so we have to do a, have a spherical corrector. Now these are not new. Kimberly pointed out some work by 
uh, Roger Angel and Jim Burge, but it's been around a long time. Here is the Arecibo radio telescope, which is a spherical reflector. It's about 1,000 feet across, 305 meters, and at the focus, uh, it used just to have these line feeds. You might remember, remember some of you guys remember those. Uh, the line, the, you get a focal line, you have all these little feeds and have a waveguide, and they add up in phase to go to your detector. But not so long ago, uh, Frank Drake, Paul Coldsmith, and others decide, well, let's have a reflective uh, spherical uh, corrector. So basically, the light comes in from the uh, spherical reflector here, goes through this, folk, creates this focal line, re-expands, you have this crazy-shaped secondary mirror, which brings it to an intermediate focus, this is an off-axis off Gregorian design. And then after bouncing through these two services, it will come to a single focus where you have your receiver. And this has been in operation for some time. I've walked around inside of this thing. This is like 80 feet across uh, inside. Um, so what we're doing with LBR basically is we're scaling a 305-meter Arecibo down to 10 meters and trying to make it work at a higher frequency. Uh, next slide. Okay. So in NIAC phase two, uh, sorry, NIAC phase one, we were able actually to build a test of this. And uh, this basic idea of using a spherical reflector and using it at high frequencies. So what we did was we bought a $350 walking sphere from a toy company in China, which is designed for kids to get inside and hopefully not suffocate and walk on water and stuff like that. So we got a supersized version that was three meters in diameter and then uh, metalized the back of the surface. And this is the only thing the students would let me do was to spray paint on the outside of the, of the sphere. And then we had the receiver system inside. This is a young. He's actually 6'3", uh, and he's inside this balloon with the Schottky receiver system. And what happens is we point it over at this reflector. Uh, next slide. Okay, great. And this is it assembled with the students who made it all happen. Uh, and uh, you're looking from the outside, this tuning fork structure with the receiver looking at the, the reflector is inside the balloon. It's inflated just like a jumping castle at your kid's birthday party. Uh, next slide. And we tested it, not at 557 gigahertz, but at 115 gigahertz. We had a lot of stuff laying around in the lab from that. We had 115 gigahertz test transmitter. Here's what would be LBR. Now, in the actual flight version of this, remember, this is the inner sphere. The outer carrier balloon is like this. would be over it. Uh, next slide. And then we may actually were able to uh, uh, have, we had a spectral line receiver in it. We could see test tones, just like we would observe a water line. And then we did a scan of the sun, and sure enough, even on a kind of messy day in Tucson, we were able to see the sun at 115 gigahertz and get diffraction-limited performance, even with this very low-tech crude system, which makes me think maybe in reality we can make this thing work. Uh, next slide. Now, we're in NIAC phase two now, so what we're doing is we're making a five meters diameter sphere for two reasons, five. One, is that we can afford to do it at five meters, get an actual balloon made, and it also fits within the available uh, high bay hangar at the Southwest Research Institute where it exists. So basically we have a five meter version of this. Have a, we're, we haven't installed them yet, but the idea is to have these internal uh, curtains to help support the structure and make it to a sphere with differential pressure and stuff like that. It hangs from a overhead crane so we can uh, test it. Uh, next slide. Here's a picture of it. It's undergoing tests now at the Southwest Research Institute. Uh, this is actually a video. Uh, maybe go ahead. Could you start that video? Um, it moves rather uh, slowly. Um, we'll see. Yeah, okay. There you can see it turning. It's turning in azimuth now. And if you look up here, you can see where, how it moves in elevation. But it's all going very slowly. I don't want to bother you with that, but it's kind of cool to watch it move up and down. Uh, how about we stop that and go to the next slide, please? All right, now what about that crazy spherical corrector? Well, this is actually the design that's uh, from Arecibo that simply scaled to what we need for LBR. And here's some dimensions on it. And so we've actually have created, a, we did, the first thing we did was make a laser, three, uh, 3D laser printer version of this. Um, uh, next slide. And that's what it looks like. Uh, all assembled. And it's actually, you say, well, how big is it going to be? Well, for a 20 meter diameter sphere, which gives us a 10 meter aperture, this whole corrector unit is about a meter in diameter, the whole thing. 
is all it is. And you can actually build it so it's integrated and sort of self-aligned. But still, there's issues, right? Because you, well, you know, wonder, well, how spherical will that inner balloon really be? Is it going to have gravitational sag? Is something going to, you know, maybe the balloon doesn't, from the manufacturer, some of the gores, which like the gores in a pumpkin, form it or out of whack and it's not perfectly sure. How are you going to deal with that? So what we need to look into and we have been looking into is making this, uh, this secondary mirror here adaptive. Uh, next slide. Okay. And here's the Mark I version. We have a Mark II version we'll show Jay uh, later in the week. But here's a Mark I version of this uh, uh, mirror. And why, can we go to the next slide and start the video for that? Okay, and so here it is in the lab in Tucson. This was built by a grad student in three days. That's how he works. He doesn't sleep for three days. Then you don't see him for three days. But it, anyway, it works. Um, and so the, the, and you can see how flexible it is for uh, compensating for non-spherical distortions in the balloon. And the, the, sort of the thing that makes this very important is that it's hard to get a piece of rubber to be reflective. And so the idea we had as part of NIAC phase one is actually uh, we got a, a bottle of silicone liquid from Home Depot and we got some aluminum powder with submicron, not submicron, some millimeter size grains in it. And basically you load up the silicon sort of half and half by weight, and then it's 80% reflective uh, at, these, uh, f at 115 gigahertz where we were testing it. And you can just flex the heck out of it. So you can make it do whatever. You can make the crazy shape. In principle, we haven't done it yet, but you can almost certainly uh, be able to compensate for large scale, slow, non-spherical distortions in the balloon itself. Thanks, uh, next slide. All right. So to correct for those non-spherical distortions, you have to know what they are. So another important factor we had to work on phase one, we're working on phase two, is the metrology. How do you do a metrology of the balloon? Measure the surface in flight. And we had a, a couple of ideas. The obvious one was to get a laser ranging system like from Faro, which we uh, got one on loan. This was at Southwest Research Institute. That's Steve Smith, who helped come up with this idea with me. And uh, he did some measurements, and yes, you can measure the surface, but then the laser scanner you know, has, you know, spins around in azimuth and elevation. It kind of makes you worry how well it would work in a balloon at 130,000 feet. So uh, the grad students, uh, next slide, actually had a better idea. I don't know where they got it from. They know about this Connects. You know, Connects is this thing on your iXbox 360. And so one of the grad students, Brandon Smith, who's shown in a silhouette right there, uh, said, hey, why don't we use the Xbox? What are you talking about? He says, well, how an Xbox works, which I had no idea, was it has an infrared laser, and it runs it through a grating. The grating splits that laser up into hundreds of little infrared dots, which paints your kids and your whole den in these dots. And the Kinex knows what the separation between those dots is in the real universe. Uh, when it leaves the uh, emitter here. And so what it does then is it uses an infrared camera to, to see where those dots fall. And it does just it's a simple parallax calculation. And of course, the further away the, the object is the dots lie on, uh, the farther the separation, will, the dots will be on the infrared camera. So it can work back and get a 3D picture of your, uh, of your family room that way. And it does it to about a millimeter accuracy. So we actually put one, take the one from my kid at home, we took it in, Brandon put it in the balloon, and we were able to measure the inside surface to about a millimeter just using, you know, uh, Xbox 360 unit from GameStop. Uh, next slide. But we, but the trouble, oh, I'm sorry, can we back up one more? I got ahead of myself. The trouble with this Xbox type approach is that it's in the infrared. And it worked great on, on, our, on our rooftop prototype until the sun came up. And then you overload the infrared detector. So the simple solution is, hey, when we get the balloon material made, we just have dots printed on them uh, at a specific uh, separation. And then we make it so that they're painted either white or black, not sure which yet. And then we can just use uh, regular uh, webcams, basically, a series of webcams to look at the surface and measure the dots and their separation. And we have a, a system working in the lab, which we'll hopefully demo for Jay uh, later in this week. Uh, next slide. Okay, now you have to have power, you have to have uh, pointing control and things like that. So what you have basically, uh, even with the LBR on the top, you do still have a gondola hanging from the bottom, we call it a service gondola. Service gondola provides power, communications, 
um, and also holds some computers and all that kind of stuff. And so in our case, the service gondola looks a lot like the, this is our STO gondola, which we'll fly again uh, later this year from Willyfield in Antarctica. So the gondola and many of the subsystems are made by the Applied Physics Laboratory. So the, the gondola and the pointing system for LBR is basically a straight carryover of technology that was developed for STO. Uh, next slide. All right, so how would this thing actually work? Well, here's what a launch, uh, sorry, LBR test flight profile would be like. And what we're hoping to do next is to convince folks at NASA that, that we would like to do a test flight of this technology after phase two. So this is how it would go for a test flight, say, from Fort Sumner. Uh, well, his pictures are from Antarctica, which we hope to do too, but not until after you do the Fort Sumner one. So basically what happens is when you inflate these balloons, they lay them out on the ground, and they have these uh, tractor trailers full of helium that inflates it. So what you do is that on the top of the balloon, you have a plate, uh, much like the Top Hat experiment did back in the 90s, where they had the telescope on top of the balloon. Um, so there's a plate here, and in that plate, there's a, an aperture, and you basically slide in an LBR canister. It's something about, you know, two, about the size of a coffin, you know, two meters tall, maybe a meter in diameter, that contains the actual uh, uh, de-inflated packed LBR sphere, with the instrument module inside with a receiver system in it. You slide it in right there on the flight line, and then it's held up while you inflate the back of the balloon with a tow balloon. This is just exactly what they did on this top hat experiment about a decade ago. And then you, uh, you rate, that holds the weight of the LBR canister, which you've seen in yellow right there. Maybe you can see it. Uh, until the bottom balloon is fully inflated. And then once it's fully inflated on the ground, this tow balloon is released. Uh, the the, the uh, balloon goes up. As it goes up, the air pressure goes down, some collars are popped here, and the, the outer carrier balloon is allowed to expand to a full 100 meters in diameter. And at that point, what you do is you basically use blowers, just like at the park with your kids' um, jumping castle, to take some of the helium, 17 million cubic feet of it, uh, from this inner, from the carrier balloon into the LBR balloon to inflate it, okay? And that's done once you near float altitude, which we want to go as high as we possibly can, 125, 130,000 feet to get above as much of the water as we can. And then you float, you take data, you do water measurements, and then you come down. And normally with a balloon, you have, as I mentioned earlier, this one parachute that carries your payload down, but we'll have two. We'll have another one that's uh, launched with a mortar on top to help bring down the uh, inner balloon, because on the inner, the LBR balloon itself has the receiver system in it, which I haven't had time to go into. You'd like to recover it if you could. Um, and then it comes down, so you actually have two payloads, two, balloon, two parachutes uh, coming down. Uh, next slide. Okay, and so now we're in NIAC phase two. We'd like to propose, have the opportunity to propose for a test flight as early as 2018. Um, after NIAC, that's where we'd like to go if uh, the fates allow. Um, and then the uh, next slide. Um, so we, what's the cost benefit of this? So here's a little comparison between just the cost. JWST comes in at more than $5 billion. Uh, Sophia is at more than $1 billion with a $70, $80 million a year operating budget for a two and a half meter telescope with a warm aperture. Now LBR, with a two-flight series, one from Fort Sumner, one from Antarctica, comes in at under $10 million, is what it would cost. So it doesn't do every, of course, it, it, it doesn't do everything that these guys do. It doesn't do anything JWS, that JWST does. It does some of the terahertz work that Sophia does, but just comparing costs is like not there. It's about as transparent as the balloon material. Uh, next slide. Okay, now what next for LBR? This is the, uh, the, the last kind of fun slide. Well, recently we're thinking, uh, working with our friends at SWERI and JPL, maybe LBR has another role as well. Maybe not at the crazy terahertz frequencies where, where we're interested in, but maybe as a humble X-band re reflector uh, that can be used in environments such as Titan. There's a lot of interest in Titan missions. So here's a nice graphic from our friends at SWERI. Um, Talking with Ralph Lorenz about this concept uh, from the Southwest region, sorry, from, uh, from APL. What excited him most about LBR was the idea, who, he's an expert in Titan, I am not, 
um, was the idea of using it as a telecom dish uh, for a high gain. And that's important because uh, back in, when I was at double EE e school, I remembered that you know, the bandwidth you can transmit back to, the, to Earth or you have in a telecom link is proportional to the power, radiated power. So for a given amount of transmitter power, you want the biggest dish you have. The bigger the dish, the more information you can coax back to Earth. And what limits uh, the science is not the technology here, just simple infrared cameras floating a, uh, a kilometer or two, a couple kilometers above the surface would bring back you know, tremendous amounts of data. The trouble is there's only, right currently, there's only like a you know, soda straw that you have to sip that data with. Whereas if you had a 10 meter or, well, I guess what, what Ralph suggested was a five meter diameter LBR, uh, then you could actually get tremendous amount of data back to Earth, even with a fairly simple uh, payload. Next slide, and I think this is the last one. So I hope I've imparted some of my enthusiasm for this project, and thank you for your attention, and I'd welcome any questions. I have a question. Sure. So you partially reflect uh, part of the sphere. I mean, you're reflecting that. What prevents it from potentially inflating at a wrong angle, in which you're not aligned and you won't see your primary? Okay. Well, um, the whole thing is actually ro is, is on an azimuth and elevation track. So you can rotate an azimuth any way you want, and you can rotate an elevation from zero degrees to 70 degrees. So you can actually move it around to, uh, to compensate for that. Okay. I presume if you're using an internal skeleton of uh, dielectric uh, sheets of some kind as a structure, uh, wouldn't that provide you the, uh, the ability to produce a, a parabolic shape on the inside of the, of the whole balloon itself? In, well, I, well I, yeah, in theory, theory, yes, you could do that, and I'm sure it would work. I think it would work up to you know, based upon what work's been done, maybe up to maybe 50 gigahertz or so. It's just that you need to be, the, the, the figure needs to be held to lambda over 16, basically for more, most of the photons to show up at the focus. And the, the wavelength, that, that 557 water line, uh, what, five, it's about the same as uh, the frequency in, what, in microns, you know, it's like 550, 30 microns, something like that. So divide that by 16, it gets really scary. Uh, to be hold to hold that parabolic shape uh, to that level, so yeah, I think it could be done, but it's easiest I think, and to it'll easily e more easily be made to work uh, if we make it a sphere. The other thing I, I didn't mention is that a sphere actually uh, can work as a parabola as long as you underilluminate it enough. For instance, say you don't believe that we can do this vertical correction stuff that we that we need to get a 10 meter aperture, the same 20 meter diameter balloon. If you throw away the spherical corrector and just under illuminate it to about two and a half meters, will work just fine as a parabola. You have to go out further along the sphere before it deviates from parabola enough to, to mess with you. So even without a spherical corrector, uh, the spherical balloon will act as a parabola, uh, a 20 meter diameter one to about two and a half meters in diameter. Well, thank you, appreciate it. <laughs>